Thank you very much, Tracy. And um, good morning, everyone. And thank you for joining us. It's lovely to see, well, I was going to say see so many people, but have an indication that there are so many people out there for whom this is of interest. Um, we're delighted to present the report. And we've been very fortunate to have the partnership with Belong and also with Stirling University to get to this point. So I'm going to just take you through a little bit of the, the background to the report and a little bit about our, our charity, which is fairly new. Um, before we actually get to some of the statistics, statistics, I can't say it this morning. So, we, as Tracy has already said, we've worked very much in partnership with the University of Stirling and with Belong to produce this report. And the survey had quite an impact. We were surprised at how many people responded. It seemed to us that there was a need for grandparents to have a voice. And that voice clearly wasn't heard. Great focus in, in the media, on care homes and what was happening with people across the world but grandparents seem to be to some extent the forgotten piece of that so in partnership with the university of sterling and belong we brought together all of the information that we could find in analysis to produce this care to the nest report and as a charity ready generations is fairly new um, we were founded in 2019 and the idea is that we want to build intergenerational relationships and understanding bringing people together in ways that possibly haven't been explored before and look at the richness and diversity of the human contribution and have that recognized across the world and to continue to push forward on what is an incredibly, incredibly important part of our lives, a society, of community and something that will lead the world forward as we go on. And we built our charity on some key values and you'll see them here on the screen. Nothing complex, very simple, but actually the key things that will make a difference to people's lives from very young children through all of the generations throughout the life course, giving value, respect and learning from everyone else. And of course, the key sense of that is belonging. Um, it's, it's no surprise that one of our partners is Belong Village and we're very excited as we go forward to be creating a genuine and first intergenerational nursery within a new care village. So that's an incredibly exciting venture for all of us. But it is about belonging, belonging to each other and belonging to the world. We want to make sure that people and our charity can exceed expectations. There are lots of stereotypical approaches to intergenerational care and certainly to people of different ages throughout the world. And I think you'll see as we go through this um, webinar this morning, I think you'll see that our focus is not simply on older people and very young people. It's about the connection between every single generation to learn from each other. And I guess lots of people have heard about living an active lifestyle, but it's about looking at that and saying, what does this actually mean? What does it mean for older people? What does it mean for young people? What does it mean to be active in all senses of the word, senses of the word? not just physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, what does it mean to be active? And the key is connecting the generations. So much wisdom, so much learning, so much emotional connection that perhaps we're missing. And that's been thrown into high relief during the period of COVID when people couldn't connect together. And I think that that's made what we're doing with Ready Generations so much more important at this moment in time and noticing the relationships, seeing how people work together, seeing how people relate to each other and putting underneath that, the giving and receiving of huge respect. This, if nothing else, has given us a window into how people feel about each other and how the world and society sees people at different ages. And above all, right in the center, it's about putting people first. And that's something that our, our charity really focuses on because those assets all together underpin the building of a stronger and more resilient and self-serving society and families working together and neighborhoods, something that perhaps hasn't connected for a long time. So we're focusing very much on those values. And that was part of our work on the Care to the Nest report. And one of the things that's, that's come out of that and that we're very proud to be partnering with the, partnering with the Stop Ageism campaign, just to make sure that perhaps sometimes unconsciously, we are discriminatory about people of different ages, particularly in terms of older people, 
but often younger people, teenagers. And it's very interesting. The global campaign to, to end ageism launched last week. And within that, there was a huge amount of people saying how they felt about other generations and how sometimes their own generation was dismissed or looked down upon by other generations. So part of what we're doing here is to encourage and embrace all ages, hence our intergenerational charity. But our focus for this morning is particularly about grandparents. And I wonder, obviously I can't speak to you, which is very sad, but have a look at the numbers on the screen here. And I wonder if you have any idea at all what those numbers represent. It's fascinating. So if you look at the first number, the big number, 1790. In 1790, most children would have approximately 12 years of relationship with their grandmother before the end of life. And only six years of interaction with grandfathers. And I'm sure that all of you will know that generally speaking, the life course of male and female has always been quite different. In 1950, grandparent, grandmothers would have 27 years on average of time with their grandchildren and 16 years for grandfathers. If we project forward to 2050, given that people are obviously living longer, that healthcare is better, that there are more ways in which you can remain active in older life, how many great grandparents will we also have in 2050? And it's something that is definitely more evident now, but who knows where this is going to go. So this is a critical moment to develop the role of grandparents and to take the learning from the report that we've produced to be able to support grandparents and support families to maximize this incredible human resource and also to make sure that grandparents get the greatest enjoyment out of their grandchildren. And interestingly, there is such a perception of what a grandparent is. And if you look at the picture on the left, there's a very traditional view of a grandparent. On the right, two very different grandparents, and clearly there's a huge age difference. And we asked a professional artist to work with children to ask them, what does a granny look like? What does a grandma look like? What does a grandparent look like? And she drew exactly what the children designed for her, what they said, a photo kit, if you like. And I think it's pretty evident. The perception here is the gray haired lady with the bun, the thick tights, the flat shoes, lots of children, smiley, usually with glasses. But actually, if you look at the contrast between that and the 21st century picture of grandparents, it's a very different process. And we're focusing very much on something called theory of mind. What happens when our beliefs, our attitudes, shape the way that we see the world, and particularly for this report, shape the way that we view grandparents. And I'm sure that this gentleman won't be a surprise to any, a stranger or a surprise to any of, any of us here today. The wonderful Colonel Tom, amazing achievement. 100 years old? Okay. Possibly dismissed by many as too old to be of any importance. What a significant difference this grandfather made to the world just by doing something simple. And what a legacy he left. What a fantastic history. And there you see exactly what his grandson said about him. We did something together that could never have happened without what Colonel Tom had done. And that's what we are hoping to do with our Care to the Nest report and the next steps of it, which we'll talk about a little later. But what a phenomenal way to think about intergenerational practice. I'm just going to stop there for a moment, um, just in case people have any questions at this stage. And I'm going to hand to Dr. Eva, um, a doctor in developmental psychology at Stirling University, another one of our partners who's helped us to write the report. Eva. Any questions that we need to pick up here? I think so. Um, so one question that uh, came up is, is basically as part of the report, our aim is basically to support grandparents in the future so that 
they are, you know, happy human beings around the grandchildren. Uh, and I think uh, one question that people are interested in is um, how can we basically support grandparents in the future to actually be um, happy humans around their grandchildren at the moment? Looks like all the beliefs and attitudes that we have towards our grandparents are heavily focused on disability and what they cannot do. Um, so I think people are wondering how how could we improve this in the future? Thanks. Thanks yeah, I mean, it, it's it's not a quick fix, but it, it yeah. starts here. Um, and, you know, from the re research that we've done and the analysis that, that Stirling University has done, that there are very specific things that grandparents are asking for, which would, would, would help with that, which we'll look at in a moment with, with Marie Claire. But I think one of the things that Ready Generation wants to do is, and I, again, I'll introduce it later, is to create um, a grandparents cooperative, a place which can work, which where parent, grandparents can talk to each other, can gain support, not to be told how to do it or how not to be old. It's not that. It's about sharing the values, the qualities, the learning that grandparents have had and then being able to work with each other. And I also, um, and those of you who've accessed the report, and if you haven't, please, please do, um, you'll see at the end of our report, there are some invitations to people to be involved with us and to support us because this isn't, we're, we're a tiny charity, we're very new. This isn't something that we can do alone. This is about working together with other organizations. Um, as I said, we're very proud to have our partnership with Stop Ageism. But I think this is something that people can now focus on and we would be delighted if people made contact with us um, to change the view of grandparents, but also to do something active and positive to make sure that we move this forward and there's actually an impact in an authentic way. Mm. Um, Vicky is interested in exploring how we can get over the fear around COVID, both from our staff, residents and grandchildren, when we had, have had over 12 months of stay away. Um, so don't touch. So I guess uh, the, the problem is now we've been trained to not touch grandparents and grandchildren, they should all stay apart. And that, that has created some fear around being with each other. And Vicky, I think, and probably many of us are now wondering how we can get over this fear in the next few months. Absolutely. I mean, I think it's true. It's not just simply care homes. It, it's exactly the same for yeah. all in society and the response, I think, of human beings who've been told don't do this for such a long time. And particularly in terms of grandparents, it's, it's quite a thing to overcome. I think the answer to that is it can only come gradually. But that doesn't mean touch is critically important, but it doesn't mean there can't be connection. Um, and I think you'll see as we move through the report, um, through, the, through the webinar today, there are many different ways for grandparents to connect and feel safe. Um, and of course, no one would be foolish enough to say, oh, it's all going to be fine. We don't actually know it's all going to be fine. Um, even having the vaccine doesn't give you a protective shield. No one really knows where that's going. I think what we have to do, however, is to stay strong in this and look for the ways that we can connect, um, even if the traditional methods are not possible for a while. And I think it will be quite difficult when people can get very close to each other. Um, you know, from my own experience, you know, when I'm out, you know, people leap away from you and you tend to do it yourself. But I think this is about, and then Tracy perhaps would know more about this than me, um, care villages have their guidance but they are managing it very effectively from what I can see and doing it gradually. It's a sort of test and learn approach. And that's not a solution. But I think you can't say to people, don't be afraid. That's like saying, just be confident. Yeah. But you can say, mitigate the fear to some extent and look for the ways that you can get there gradually without saying, right, we're all going to hug each other tomorrow. And connecting with grandparents, connecting with intergenerations isn't just about hugging. There are many different ways that you'll see. Thank you, Vicky, for that. Uh, Lena is wondering, um, because there's quite a huge difference in the time children spend on average with grandmothers and grandfathers, um, whether we need a different support system or a different approach 
for grandmothers and grandfathers, I guess more generally um, speaking. Um, yeah. That's again, fascinating question. Yeah, it's something, as you know, Eva and Mary Claire, fascinating and something that is starting to come out. Um, and this, the report that we have is merely the start. It, it's the foot in the water. And two aspects of it have come out very strongly, which you'll see a little later. One is the role of grandfathers and the other is, is the use of technology. But as you're asking about grandfathers, that we, I think we do need to not necessarily separate it out, but look at it differently, how, how much more grandfathers can be involved. And many years ago, and I, this shows how old I am, I, I guess, um, there was an advertisement where there was a phone call and the, the older gentleman in the room answered the phone and then passed it immediately to his wife. I don't know if it was daughter or granddaughter. And there was that sense of bypass the grandfather, go straight to the female. So we want to delve much more deeply into that aspect of the research, but it's indicated in the, the report that we've written at the moment. So yes, absolutely. not to separate it out, but I think we need to look at it differently, but still make sure that there's equity between grandmothers and grandfathers. Yeah, absolutely. And it's going to be one of our focus in the future as well. Certainly is. Two more questions, one especially that has raised uh, some lots of feedback from others now, uh, before we move on to Mary Claire. Um, so one question that uh, Kate or one point that Kate came up with is how do we highlight grandparent role rather than just a biological grandparent? So often younger generations report so many friendships with older people that are not necessarily biologically related, but it's um, and that aspect never gets highlighted in the media. And I think that's an excellent point that Kate made. So how can we highlight this in the future that it's about the role that a grandparent, like that older people have for us and it's not about the grandparent itself? Absolutely. And I think, you know, and I know I'm, I'm, I'm saying, yes, we've got, we've picked up that in the report and you'll see it in a moment. That's incredibly true. Um, and it's also picked up in terms of 21st century relationships where the grandparent, is the, the, the traditional family is much more rare to find now. And many, and I include myself in this, my, I didn't have my grandparents when I was very young. Older people in, in the community were very important to me, particularly my godmother. Um, so I think we do need to highlight it. And I think what we would welcome is people sending in their thoughts, their ideas and their own experiences of having someone older who is not a biological parent or someone who brings experience and all kinds of wisdom that's not a biological grandparent. So I think it's a critical piece. And I thank uh, Kate, is it Katie for Kate for raising that. Um, yes, definitely something that we feed into the next iteration of the report. But, it, but if people have responses and ideas, please, please do send them in. It's one, this, this report has initiated something bigger we know that there are lots of grandparent links across the world but we would like to focus on the things that are not so highlighted so yeah. fantastic, fantastic point well made Kay in fact writes that she has written her doctoral thesis about this and she would be happy to share it with us so we would love to see this thesis for sure um i to raise one more point that was made by Tracy before we move on to Marie Claire, and then we will have lots more space for questions. Well, indeed. So uh, Tracy says we need to recognize that parents are the uh, grandparents are the sandwich generation. Often the, they have caring responsibilities for the grandchildren, for the parents. I, I guess they often give us advice as well and uh, still balancing employment and careers. So it's quite a heavy demand uh, and, and grandparents are often, I think it's overlooked what they all do for society as a whole. And I think it's, Tracy is raising this point, which I, I guess we agree as well. So we absolutely do. And, and Tracy, thank you for raising that. Absolutely. And I sit here as a grandmother myself with a full-time job. Um, so yeah, absolutely. And I think Marie Claire's got some evidence on that. So it, it's yeah. a good point. And thank you, Tracy, for raising it. Absolutely true. The solution, I don't know whether we have a solution to it, but we certainly have some interesting evidence. But again, please feel free to, to be part of the invitations that we that we issue to you. 
Absolutely. I think, uh, so please, uh, I'll keep an eye on the chat for questions. And I think we can now move on to Marie-Claire, who will now present the results that we've been analyzing over the past few months. Thank you, Eva. Okay, Marie-Claire, over to you. Thanks, Eva and Pam. Um, so I'm going to go over some of the main findings um, from the, the report. Um, what I would say, as Pam is as kind of alluded to, these probably raise more questions going forward that we would hope to explore together than set answers. Um, so I hope it gets you, you thinking a little bit about what's next. Um, so first of all, we looked at, in our first section, the time that grandparents spent with grandchildren during the pandemic. Now we found that overall, 98% of grandparents had reduced, significantly reduced contact with their grandchildren because of the restrictions. Um, but because of this, as you can see in the graph on the right hand side, grandparents did keep in communication with their grandchildren through primarily mobile phone and video contact, so video calls. So 70% or over um, used these as forms of communication to maybe alleviate that, that isolation that they experienced from each other. Um, we also looked at the differences between recreational activities which would be the things that we kind of think of as fun, like playing outdoors, going to the museum, going to the zoo. We looked at recreational activities and we also looked at chore based activities and chore based being household chores, washing the car, doing the shopping. And we found that the recreational fun activities, they reduced significantly more than the chore based activities did. Um, for example, as you can see on the left hand side, 93% there was a 93% reduction in library and museum visits, but I think household chores only reduced by 49%. So grandparents were still doing these chore-based activities, more so with their grand for grandchildren. And that raises, I suppose, questions going forward about um, the, the, the role that grandparents play, the important role they played during the pandemic while parents were working. Moving on now to the next slide, please, Pam. We can indeed. The second section that we looked at was how grandparents provide childcare. Um, now, during the pandemic, there was a significant reduction in childcare, but before the pandemic, over a third of grandparents did do some form of childcare. And those childcare duties included picking up and dropping off from school, um, evening and overnight care, and after school care. Um, now, interestingly, what we did find was that the more childcare duties that a grandparent did, the more burdensome that they found this. So the more they did, the more tired they felt. And this is illustrated on the graph on the left. So those with two childcare duties on average, they found childcare a burden, whereas those that had very little or fewer childcare duties didn't find it so burdensome. And then if we move over to the, the right graph, we also looked at how successful grandparents felt as a result of these childcare roles. And we found that the more childcare duties a grandparent did, the less successful they felt. So even though they're involved in this family and, and doing these different duties, there's something there that's making them feel a little bit less successful the more they do. So these expectations that they've got to do childcare are impacting their perceptions of success. Uh, next slide, please, Pam. Thanks. So we then looked at the dyadic relationship between grandparents and their grandchildren. So basically, how do grandparents see themselves in this role and in this relationship? Now, interestingly, most grandparents, so over two thirds of grandparents or roundabout, they found themselves identifying closely with instructor type roles and also companion type roles. So very much looking at the emotional and social development of grandchildren and how they input into that. So for example, they saw themselves as problem solvers, wise elders, listeners and storytellers. Um, moving on, please, Pam. However, they less identified with practical support roles. So around about, whereas we've got nearly a, nearly two thirds for practical um, companion and support companion and instructor roles, the practical roles were less identified with. So round about a half to just over a half of grandparents identified with these. 
including things like being a taxi driver for your grandchild or giving health and medical advice. There was a really interesting finding that these roles were identified with based on the age of grandchildren. So the more grandchildren a grandparent had between age four and 10, the more likely they were to identify as an instructor or a companion. However, as the, the grandchild grew up into the 11 to 18 year old um, age bracket, the more likely grandparents were providing that practical role support. So this shows that grandparents are quite adaptable in the face of the demands and the needs of their grandchildren. Next slide, please, Pam. Now, we also related this to how grandparents feel about themselves in terms of success and importance. So when grandparents are doing companion roles and instructor roles, again, the more that they do of those roles, the less successful they tend to feel. So we can see up here that if a grandparent is averaging four activities or four roles, um, such as listener, um, wise elder, then they find it hard. Whereas those that are doing less than two find that they, they feel that they're doing really, really well as grandparents. So this, you know, raises questions again about it might be quite intensive to be that listener and to be that wise elder, whereas the practical roles are maybe less emotionally and socially demanding. Next slide, please, Pam, thank you. Nevertheless, I think to round this section up, we did look at how important grandparents feel in relation to these roles. And the more roles that a grandparent does, the more important they, they feel. So as we can see here, there's a linear relationship. So as a companion and as an instructor, those doing just about around about four roles felt like they played a really very important role in their grandchild's life, um, which is something that I think is really, really positive to finish with. So that's, that's the, a whirlwind tour of the main findings. Um, if anyone has any questions. Thank you, Marie-Claire, for the summary of the findings. Um, so uh, I think one question that people are interested in is um, how, how can we explain this, that grandparents overall feel less successful when they do a lot for their grandchildren. And I think this is something that we were quite surprised by, uh, by this finding, Pam and Marie-Claire. Um, well, like maybe we can summarize the discussions we have had around that. Uh, yeah, so I think that is a really interesting one because some of the things I've been thinking about is what are maybe the parental expectations that are placed on grandparents? Um, within the family? Is it to do childcare and chores and things like that while the parents working at home during the pandemic or, or not at home? Um, is that how parents see that role? Um, so that's a question that I've got um, going forward. I don't know about you, Pam. Yeah, no, no, I think I absolutely agree with you. Absolutely. And I think another really interesting finding was how the pandemic has impacted on grandparents and how they interact with the kids. So it's quite interesting that chore based activities went down, but by far as not as much as uh, all the fun based activities, uh, which might on the one hand side not be surprising. But on the other hand, it just shows how important grandparents are that even during the pandemic, they were still providing all these chore based activities that need to be done despite all the threatening aspects of the pandemic that we see. Um, I, I just have a look at the chat box. First of all, Federica, she, she's our kindergarten manager in our play group and she's joined us today as well. And uh, lovely to see you, Federica. And Federica is here, um, you know, from the child's perspective as well, which is an important one. And she says that um, children's perceptions on aging is quite difficult to capture and also gets overlooked as well. And um, I think, um, it could be because we apply our own adult values on, on the children. Um, and I think this is a really critical aspect as well, because 
it just goes to show how we as adults also impact on how children view grandparents. And if we ever want to change that, I think we have to start with the very young ones as well. Um, yeah. Um, Kay says it uh, resonates with the experiences of grandparents who are kinship carers. Um, yeah. I'm just reading what Lena's, Lena has a question. So did the grandparents in the survey have a chance to elaborate on how they got into being responsible for those roles? For example, did it start um, with one task and slowly over time got added more and uh, yeah, or did they do them all from the start? So yeah, th there was opportunities, Lena, in the survey to look at pre-pandemic and post-pandemic for some things like contact, um, but not specifically for childcare. But I think you've raised a really important question, like how does that evolve for grandparents and, and families? And um, maybe how that has, the specifics of that has changed during the pandemic. Like the, the restrictions come and it all got loaded on or was it a natural continuation of what they've done before the pandemic? So yeah, I think there's there's work there to explore. Um, Vicky has a, uh, Vicky just wrote uh, a really interesting point because uh, relating back to uh, the commitments and how bad you feel. Um, so Vicky says, from personal experience, I felt that I had to let my grandchildren down by not being able to say yes to childcare due to my own working commitments. Not sure whether this would have been a factor in the study. Mm. I think this is a really important point that you're raising here, Vicky, because um, it also shows how all the duties that grandparents have, uh, which get overlooked by society, but how as a grandparent, you have to decide and then you feel bad, whatever you do. It's kind of, do I need to do childcare or do I, do I go on to do my working commitment? Constantly feels like I have to decide. And if I ever gonna say no to my grandchildren, I'm a bad grandparent. Is this something that resonates with uh, people in the chat here? I think that balance isn't between expectation and guilt. <laughs> and I think yeah. it's built up very strongly, very strongly. Absolutely. Without solution as yet, but I do think it's something that people feel very strongly about. Yeah. Um, Lena says, following up from what we've just said earlier, I wonder if grandparents, once they've taken up those many tasks, if they feel unable to get back out of them, if they would want to. And that might be a way uh, on how we could support them. But in order to support them appropriately, I think it might be important to know how they got to, to be responsible for these tasks. I think um, this is a, um, this relates really nicely to COVID because um, I've heard grandparents say, COVID has actually given me the opportunity to say no sometimes to some tasks that they didn't want probably in the first place, but without feeling guilty. And it might actually, and some were actually a bit worried that after lockdown, they would be roped into those tasks again. Uh, and I think that probably uh, the, the pandemic or lockdown may be a, a risk, might be an opportunity to, for grandparents to reflect on their roles and how much they are doing and what it feels like not to be tasked with all those roles and maybe to be able to pick uh, what they want in the future a bit more. Um, so I think this is a really, really important uh, point that you're raising here, Nina. Um, Chris has a question for us. Have you looked at social and cultural differences in relationships between grandparents and grandchildren? Mm. Pam, do you want to go for that one or? I will, yeah. I mean, I'm going to pick that up in, in the next section, actually. But yes, we have. Um, not in depth as yet, but of course, family configurations are very different now. Um, other locations come into it. So we've started to look at that from the perspective of, of people who are relocated, people who are um, have married into a, to a different nationality. So I'll, I'll pick that up in a moment or two. But yes, we have, but only just started that piece of research that's part of our next our next intention 
I think um, Kay, said, uh, Kay has another interesting point. So she said her colleague Kim Hall from Northumbria is studying kinship care at the moment. Um, and Kay says she uh, doesn't know much about it, but she has uh, studied experiences extensively. And in fact, um, I think uh, in our department, Sharon Kessler is also studying uh, what kinship means in order like for caring for uh, your um, next to and kinship related people. And uh, it does make a difference uh, in terms of how responsible you feel. And I think that would we should probably look into Kim Hall's work um, and see uh, how this relates to what we have found as well. Thank you very much, Kay, for, for this point. Yeah, absolutely, thank you. So there's three more comments, um, which I would like to get to before we move on, but I'm very conscious please, of time. Please do, Ever, it's fine. Is that okay? Right. So Tracy says that um, Lena has made a really interesting point. Um, and she asks, at what stage is the extent to the relationship led by children and what uh, age is the child to determine that? So I think, Marie Claire, we've had some results on how the, the age of the child really matters in the relationship, in the type of the relationship. Um, but uh, we didn't quite, we don't, we can't speak to how much of it was actually led by the child. But Marie Claire, do you wanna maybe say a few words about how age actually impacted the relationship? Yeah, like we saw it in how grandparents identify. So as grandparent, as grandchildren get older, the grandparent obvious like tends to be taking a more practical based role. So it's less about the emotional and the social. Um, but that that does raise questions about is that just because it's easier practically, and there's you you know grandchildren have maybe other commitments and things, or is it because the grandchildren are maybe ha seeing their grandparents less or they're maybe not communicating by mobile phone like there could be a million reasons maybe why that that relationship changes um so it would be really important again to explore that because i think it, it does raise more questions um, yeah absolutely and in fact it was picked up by other people saying how this bi-directional relationship really is indeed um a really key aspect to look at what is driven by whom. So I think that's something we need to pick up in the future. Um, I think um, Chris has made an interesting point. Um, so in the research um, that Chris was doing, uh, they looked at attitudes to young children in parts of Spain and parts of England, and they found differences in intergenerational relationships. So in England, generations tended to be compartmentalized, whereas Spain, there were fewer segregated spaces. Uh, very interesting point. Uh, like, yeah. So I, I think it would be interesting to look at how this impacts the relationship as well, um, and uh, how actually how this impacts the happiness around how you feel in that relationship as well. Um, okay. So one question Olivia has is. So she, she really likes the findings. Thank you so much, Olivia, for saying that. Um, and uh, we are very happy to share the findings, definitely. Um, one question Olivia has is whether uh, the grandparents in the study had cognitive impairments. So for example, were they um, suffering from dementia? Um, yeah, and how basically she's wondering about how those results can be generalized uh, across the broader um, generation of grandparents. Mm. So we asked 206 grandparents and the mo majority of, well, over 50% of them were, were between the ages of 55 and 64. Um, so, you know, that's like a good chunk of the, the participants. Um, and they all had a, most, I can't remember the exact figure, but most had kids between zero and 11. So a younger age bracket. Um, and it, it was mostly conducted through through the Belong villages and you know the outreach from there so we can say that probably to generalize that we would need to do more um because as you can see that's quite a specific sample of, of grandparents um we didn't ask into the health demog like the demographics such as health um but it's, it's things that from it have, have came out as well that would be interesting to explore next and 
Um, so yeah, thanks for raising that point. I think it's important going forward. Most definitely, most definitely. I think we've got plenty of work to do going forward. <laughs> yeah, so that's one thing I, I can see how people would like to link up. After, like, I, I know that uh, Kay would be happy to share this, the doctoral thesis, and then I can see how people would like to keep in touch. Maybe that's something we should pick up at the end of the session. Um, and there have been loads more comments. Um, I think maybe it would still be good, Pam, if we maybe started the third part, just in case people Absolutely. have soon and maybe we can then have the discussion around the comments i i'm seeing them don't worry uh but i think we'll move on to the absolutely first. and we'll catch them and thank you very much everyone for actually posting the questions absolutely a, a lot more work to do which is great yeah um so just just to pick up on some of the things that that we've talked about this this morning um obviously there's a, there's a lot of depth in the report we absolutely encourage you to do that but it's interesting to, to look at the demographic. We've talked about age. And when we looked at the, the number of grandparents that responded to us, there were actually some very, very young people. Not that that surprised us, but clearly there is the perception, you saw it in the first slide, of the age of grandparents and what a grandparent looks like. And also the different relationships. And most grandparents had actually responded to say that they had felt, I'm going to use the word bereft, um, not to have that contact, that direct child, direct relationship with their, with their grandchildren, because as, as we feel here, it's great to use a screen, it's great to have some kind of contact, but it's not the same as actually having a human interaction in the same room or even through a window. Um, so we want to look very closely, and that was a great point that was just raised, raised about, you know, the, the cognitive impairment, um, how, how grandparents are, their health, how that works. So we need to look at the whole demographic, although we have some indicators from the sample that we have. And then again, this was raised, um, is the 21st century families. What is a family? What constitutes a family in the 21st century? Um, and one of the things that came out very strongly and something for us to research further is the idea of step-grandparents or, st or step-great-grandparents who, during COVID, when you were, you were working out your bubble, the people who were probably closest to the child, blood relatives, if they existed, were the ones that perhaps had the first choice, the first ability to actually connect with the child physically, whereas step-grandparents were literally stepped further back. There was also the matter of uh, grandparents who lives in, live in other parts of the world, other parts of the country, the lack of travel. And no such thing as a typical 21st century family exists. So there are many, many facets to what we found and we have literally only touched the surface. But what came out of it are many of the offshoots. Someone spoke about um, kinship, someone spoke about non-biological people in, a role, in the role of a grandparent. So I think these are all aspects that we need to look at. But within our report, we've tried to pick up that, pick that up as much as we possibly could. And also, it's the relationship within those families. Someone, I think, mentioned different cultures, different jurisdictions, different nationalities. There are many, many different ways in which families interact with the grandparents. In certain parts of the world, grandparents live with the family. It's just expected. In other parts of the world, that's not the case. Some parts of the world, the grandfather is the most important connection. Others, it's the grandmother. And I'm using the word grandfather and grandmother interchangeably in terms of a relationship that takes, that models the relationship that a blood relative grandparent would have with a grandchild. And so those relationships are changing all the time. The other thing that changes the relationship, and you've just alluded to it, is the age of the grandchildren. Um, you know, we often, the stereotypical again is the older grandparent with a very young child. That's not the case. You know, with my own experience, I have a 14 year old, a nine year old, a seven year old and a three year old. Um, that's a lot of different kinds of relationships and trying to be something to all of those children is quite a difficult ask. And we found that when we asked grandparents exactly what it was that they felt that they, they needed some support with. Um, and it's interesting the impact that children have on grandparents. Um, I don't know if any of you, you may know about this already, but this is, a, this is a, um, an island in Japan, Okinawa, and most of the residents there live to at least 100, um, have wonderful relationships with grandchildren, have wonderful 
relationships at an emotional level and stay incredibly active. And part of that activity is the interaction with children and younger members of the wider family. So there is clearly a relational impact here, and we've seen it very much through COVID. I'm sure Tracy would talk about this much, much more eloquently than I would in terms of um, grandparents not being able to see their grandchildren, not being able to have the human connection. So it's interesting to show that that actually supports a longer and healthier life to have those interactive relationships. And when we look back at the things that grandparents did, and Mary Claire's picked this up already in some of the research, but time before COVID, um, you know, most grandparents had no real fixed agenda with their grandparents, unless of course they had specific childcare duties, picking children up from nursery, going to school, doing, being a taxi service, which you've seen. But most grandparents really celebrated the flexible relationships, the opportunity to just decide on the day or the moment what they do with the children. And a huge amount of parents wanting to spend time outside in nature with the children. And I know throughout COVID, we've all been told, you know, it's safer outdoors, which is a fantastic thing for particularly for, for, for children to be told, yep, you're much better off outdoors. But grandparents sharing their own knowledge of nature or, or just being out there with the children, doing things like digging in the garden, planting, um, you know, working with older grandchildren to build things. And the nurturing role that comes as part of that and all we've already alluded to the role of the wise elder or the wise person in the family who can share some of the information and the experiences that they've had but also take the children to the next stage of their own lives cooking and baking we said featured largely and we look at that in an interesting way as to how that changed during covid and for some grandparents just being able to chill with their grandchildren just actually being in the same space and just feeling that relationship was absolutely critical. But of course, that changed with, with COVID. And what we, we found was that although grandparents, some grandparents commented that they, they thought children spent too much time using technology and that had a detrimental effect, actually technology saved the relationship in many, many respects. So if you look at the two, two pictures here, the one on the right, um, Two grandparents obviously having an interaction with the child. But interestingly, this family did a lot of cooking and baking together. Um, that moved from being a physical activity to having the laptop in the kitchen and the grandmother actually sharing the cooking with the child and telling the child how they could do it. So the relationship remained and the activity remained, but on screen. And on the left there, you know, the children reading a book, what you can't hear is the grandparent reading the story in the background and the children following the story. So although the activities had to move to a different modality, some of that re remained as it was before. Um, and then there was, of course, there was the provision of childcare. And I think one of the things that came up very strong before us was the fact that children respected their grandparents and wanted that relationship with the grandparents because this was the one person or two people in their life who actually thought the sun shone out of them. Um, and again, that's been part of the child care approach, not simply looking after a child, but grandparents who perhaps some of them have a little more time. And this also contributed to something that was brought up earlier on, the point about you know, grandparents feeling guilty when they don't have the time to be with their grandchildren. Um, and then, of course, the relationship changed throughout the COVID period, where we went from the picture on the left, grandparents having lots of interaction, guiding, this is a great granny, guiding her own granddaughter in the care and upbringing of, of, a small, of her own smaller child, and moving to some relationships that actually became much more distant. So we would like to explore even further the longer term impact of that and how childcare might change after the pandemic. We've already re referenced it um, and ever picked up the question which was about, you know, after this, do grandparents have more choice of how they support their grandchildren? Can they actually choose the activities that they enjoy the most? Um, and Maria Claire again has shared with you the research that we've done and the analysis into the dyadic relationship, which clearly has changed over time, um, simply because of the fact that parent, the grandparents can't be as close to their grandchildren. But these photographs, you know, for us, 
sum up how things are. You know, the closer you can be to your grandchild, the better. Did that impact the dyadic relationship? For many grandchildren, grandparents, it appeared not. However, it will be interesting to look at a longer term study of that. And so what we did ask was of grandparents, what is it that you feel, are there any things that you feel that you would like more support and more help with? And it's really interesting to see what came out of it. And obviously this is where we decided that we would like to create a grandparent cooperative. I mentioned it earlier, the place where grandparents can talk to each other, receive support, but there are some very specific aspects that they asked for which was the dynamic between themselves and the grandchildren. How could they be helped more? They wanted more information on child development, which is, is a very interesting one. Um, what to look for, how to support children of various ages in the family at different stages in their life. How do you do that? What kind of things happen now, which would support children who are living in the 21st century, very different from our own childhood. They also wanted how to make a difference in terms of the children's emotional, social and well-being. Um, how could they best deal with that? How could they manage it? Where could they go for support? Where could they go to read or research the things that they could do best to help the family? And one of the things that lots of grandparents reported was that they had been asked during COVID to support children's learning online or their remote learning or their homework. Now that's a pretty big ask, um, depending on the age of the children. Um, I know myself, I've had to do some incredibly um, complicated things that I, I don't think I did when I was at school, but how could they best support education without doing things for their, for their, for their grandchildren? How could they know where to go next and how to find the support for that? And of course, the conversation, the dialogue between grandchildren and grandparents about behavior, about being able to regulate behaviour. For some grandparents, there was a feeling that the children thought that they could get away with an awful lot with grandparents. And for others, where children were presenting with some, some emotional and, and behavioural difficulties, how do they cope with that? How do they interact with the parent? How do they make sure that they're not giving different messages? And then the other one was how grandparents wanted to know, how do we deal with very difficult conversations? How do we talk about different emotional issues? How do we talk about changes? How do we talk about differences, things that happen in the family, families that split? How do we deal with that? Which of course, all would improve the dyadic relationship. But what became very clear through all of this, um, and this is something that we hold very strongly onto for Ready Generations is, that we know that grandparents, whether they are biological, whether they are kinship relationships, whether they are blood relatives, whether they are step grandparents, great grandparents, it doesn't matter, that there was a feeling within families, whatever their configuration, that the grandparents bring an awful lot to the table. And I think this, this is a good place to, to move on from, that everyone, whether they're children, older people, people of all generations, that they bring not just the strengths they have at the moment, but the gifts and strengths of families and communities, everyone in fact, who can impact on the lives of grandchildren. I'm just gonna stop there for a moment before I close the, the session, Eva. Thank you so much, Pam. Um, we've had lovely um, comments now, uh, while you were speaking as well, people were sharing their own experiences and I think, it just shows how varied the experiences were during COVID. So for example, Jean says they just retired not long before the lockdown and then it became part of the childcare bubble for their grandson, grandchild James. Um, and it didn't take long that schools were closed. So they were highly involved in the homeschooling. And actually they, they saw teams really regularly during the week and they were able to bond and build a really meaningful relationship. And in fact, they are now missing James quite a bit after the lockdown was uh, like after school started to, to open again. So I think this shows that um, also COVID has had the impact that you could actually form really close bonds. Um, but then we've had somebody, um, uh, oh, Kay also shared her very, very creative ways of interacting, like 
building um, like paper airplane messages. Uh, also, the children hid treasures and pictures in the garden and their great grandpa had got to go out and find it when they were gone. So I, I love this idea. Uh, so people were really creative and it just shows how be really wanting to be with somebody brings out the most creative ways of trying to interact and, and make gifts for each other, basically. Absolutely. Um, and, and then we've had other people saying, well, first of all, my, grand, my child was born and their grandparents have not seen it at all, only over Skype. And it brings up this idea of how can we interact with babies on video calls? Very difficult. It's easier when the grandchild is older, obviously. And then one important point that I felt was made is that sometimes people had to decide who they put into the bubble. So sometimes that meant they had to, um, you know, go for one grandparent over the other, uh, creating a feeling of guilt, um, which I think is very important. Um, Thank you, Evelyn. Yeah. So I've lost track because there were so many comments. Um, we'll, we'll make sure that we capture the chat. I'm conscious of time, but we'll certainly make sure that we capture all of that. I think Vicky, like, let me read out the last comment. And then we can, if somebody wants to unmute themselves and ask a question directly, we can probably do that too. But Vicky says such a fascinating topic has really made me think about both work and home life aspects of grandparenting. And I have posed myself some questions and actions to put forward. So thank you so much. We'll give you, we'll give you the grandparent award, Vicky, for that, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so apologies if I missed a question. Um, yeah. So if somebody wants to unmute themselves to ask a question, a burning question they have, maybe feel free to do so now. Um, um, that would be that's absolutely fine um ever while while that's happening i'm just i just want to give you some invitations to actually join us and work with us um absolutely. i mentioned already that we have a we are establishing a grandparents learning cooperative um so you've got the the website information comes up will come up at the end for you um, and the idea, as I said, is to capture the information that we have from this, what really was a wonderful study for us, but actually in the scheme of things, a very small study. And now we want to open that out further. And we certainly have some invitations in the back of our report that suggest places where people might want to be involved with. And anyone on the, on the call today who would like to be involved, I will give you some contact details at, at the end of this. Um, but we're hoping to establish this very quickly so that um, we can have grandparents supporting each other and, you know, having conversations and sharing ideas, strategies and actually coming back to the information that they need, which I mentioned on the on the last slide. And I'm sure there's far more than that. Um, and I look at this slide and the one that springs out to me is as a grandparent, I hope I am everything to them. I think that's the hope of most grandparents. Um, so, as I said at the very beginning, our intention as a charity working in partnership with, with Belong and with Sterling, we want to connect communities of all ages, we want to support nurturing relationships, and it doesn't matter whether it's children, young people, families, older people, it doesn't matter. It's about the connection that brings us all together and creates a much more equitable and respectful society. And I want just to finish with this. Um, at the beginning, Tracy mentioned, and thanks Tracy for that, that Sue sadly lost her mum yesterday. Um, this is Connie um, with her great granddaughter, Pixie. Um, and we would like very much to dedicate this session today to Connie's memory, wonderful lady, very feisty lady who refused to the bitter end to let anything as simple as advancing years restrict what she did a hugely strong lady and believe me i can share with you now if you've ever been told off by connie for not arranging the flowers properly i can tell you exactly what that feels like so in memory of connie um outstanding gran and a fantastic great gran um we dedicate this session to her today and as it says there let us decide on the route that we're going to follow and attempt to sow 
flowers in the world. I think we've started something. We certainly haven't finished it. Uh, if you would like to be in touch with us, both Sue and my contact details are there. Um, I'd probably say respectfully, I'd um, probably be, give Sue a few, few days grace on that one. But thank you very, very much for listening. Thanks to Eva and to Tracy and to Marie Claire and to Mel for hosting us in the background. Um, it's been a privilege to share some of our very early findings with you. Thank you very much.